the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegan, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. then nobody else can hear you. Uh, we're going to, Kathy's going to start the meeting and we're going to do one side at a time. We'll pass the microphone back and forth on this side and then we'll bring it back up on this side and the cameraman will follow you. We have a young lady who's been leading us for 10 years and uh, we appreciate all her efforts but she'd like to start the meeting by having uh, something to say, I presume. Good evening historians and I want to welcome you all to the Greater Centerville uh, Historians Gathering. Um, we just have a few simple rules that when you want to ask a question, then raise your hand and then state your full name. And if you want to talk about somebody or the Lincolns, then don't use any nicknames. Um, and I will introduce Denise Blaze. She's from Arshkarsh. And she's going to portray Elizabeth Todd Edwards, the sister of Mary Lincoln. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Denise, and we're delighted to have you here. And this is the second time that we had Denise, and she just does a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Have you introduced yourself also and where you're from, please? Okay. Well, my name is Elizabeth Todd Edwards, and <laughs> actually I live in Springfield, Illinois, and I've come a long way today. Charlie Bauer from Newton. Okay. And then we'll just pass the mic this way and that way. All right. Kathy, we got? Yep, we yep. got Kathy. There we go. I'm Cheryl Bauer from Newton. Thank you. Marie Rosenbauer from Newton. Thank you. Lisa Elson from Newton. Thank you. Wayne Cherney, Manitowoc. Thank you. Janet Vogt, Manitowoc. Thank you. Don Vogt, Manitowoc. Thank you. Marilyn Heinemann, <coughs> Howard Scrolls. John Wiegan, Centerville. And I would mention this is Flag Day, June 14th. Very good. Thank you. Melvin Wong, Town of Schleswig. Thank you. Elaine Wong, Town of Schleswig. Thank you. Also. Irene Dine, Cleveland. Thank you. Alice Mathias, Cleveland. Selma Vogel, Cleveland. Kenny Hawkins, Sheboygan. Thank you. Shepard Goodnow, Sheboygan. Janet Miller, Cleveland, and Loretta. No. Helen Nassa, Manitowoc. Thank you. Melvin Janey, Cleveland. Thank you. Kathy Janey, Cleveland. Thank you. Eileen Bailitz, Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you, Janet Miller. Okay, show, Glenn Viola. Joan Weaverstead, uh, Sheboygan. Russ Weaverstead, Sheboygan. Thank you. Jean Pfeiffer, Sheboygan. Thank you. Beth Hollander, Cedar Lake. Thank you. Twilight Schrader, Cedar Lake. Thank you. Audrey Odo, St. Canadian. Thank you. Rick Firestorff, Town Mimi. Thank you. Gary Leonard, Town of Sheboygan. Thank you. Mary Ann Thompson, Sheboygan. Thank you. Bernice Ehrlicher, Sheboygan. Thank you. Susan Curtis, Plymouth. Thank you. Nancy Rory, Plymouth. Very good. Oh, we have a Thank you. In the back. Yep, that's cool. Sharon Carlson, Keel. Thank you. Alice Waldo, Manitowoc. Thank you. Very good. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. Uh, it was a long journey for me to come, but I know my way here now since I was here previously uh, last fall. Uh, last fall, if you remember, if you were here, I mainly talked about uh, my sister, Mary Lincoln. Uh, 
She was five years younger than me. And we grew up together, of course. And it was because of me that I actually got her and Mr. Lincoln together, even though later on we regretted it. We really did not want the two of them to marry. I'll get into that a little bit later. But really why I came today is because of there was some interest in the Todd family, which is my family. There are quite a few of us. Actually, there are two sets of families, and I will get into that today, too. But what I, how I will start is basically talking about our family and the time that we lived. As you remember the time between 1861 and 1865, that was a horrible time in our uh, uh, nation's history. And our family was basically torn apart. Some because of how they felt uh, of slavery or states' rights or keeping the union together. We had varying opinions. That was very common during that time. There was son that went against father, brother against brother. Many, many families were torn apart during that time period. But our family was a little more unique because we had a family member that was the president of the United States. And that uh, made a little bit of difference in what we did, what people saw of us, the press that members got of our family. And it was a very trying time. So this is where I'll start at the beginning with our father. Maybe. My father was Robert Smith Todd. And actually, his father, Levi Todd, and brother were the founders of Lexington, Kentucky, where all of us were born. Now, our father, Robert, was a very wealthy man. His father and, and uncle fought in the Blue Licks battle. And because of their service, the government paid them in land instead of money. So they were able to acquire quite a bit of land around Lexington, or the area that they settled in, and then later known as Lexington. It was a very nice area. The water in that area was perfect for distilling good Kentucky bourbon. There was a lot of it being made, and a lot of it being drunk. I'll get into that a little bit later also. There was also good land uh, for Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, thoroughbred horses were raised there. Our father had quite a bit of land for that. He dabbled in a lot of things, but everything he did, he did very well and became very wealthy. Of course, with the land and all of the things that he did, he was a, a large uh, slaveholder. Of course, our father never said he had slaves, he had servants. There was a difference. And of course, he said he never bought a slave. All of his servants were inherited. He marries our mother, Eliza Parker Todd, in 1812. And they move into the home right next to our grandmother, Grandmother Parker, until our mother started having a large family. And then they moved into a large brick home, very, very nice, on Main Street in Lexington. But then our mother passes away after the birth of her seventh child, and he remarries and marries Betsy Humphreys and starts another family. Uh, and then after a few years of doing everything well that he did, one thing couldn't, he couldn't stop was the cholera epidemic that swept through Lexington in 1849, and he became one of its victims. This is my father's first family. I was the first born, Elizabeth Porter Todd. I was born in 1813. Then came my sister Frances Jane in 1815, Levi Owen in 1817, 
my sister Mary in 1818. Then we had a small baby that didn't live very long that was named after our father, Robert. He was born in 1821. Then our sister Anne Marie in 1824. And then George Rogers Clark was the child that our mother gave birth to and then died the next day. This is me. I am Elizabeth Todd Edwards. And as I said before, I was the firstborn of uh, our, our uh, parents' 14 surviving children. In Lexington, I met a man named Minion Wirt Edwards, who was a student at Transylvania University. And he was the father, or he was the son of the first territorial governor of Illinois. We were married when I was 18 and moved to uh, Springfield when uh, just before uh, Ninian's father lost the election of governor. But for a while, I was the hostess for the, nearly the whole state of Illinois. So I learned how to be very gracious, how to put on parties and soirees. And I was very much known for my parties, especially my Sunday soirees that you really wanted to be seen at if you were anybody in Springfield. <coughs> And at that time, Springfield was a budding new capital of Illinois after it had moved from Vandalia. And it was my nature to be loving and caring and always looking out for my younger siblings. Because after our mother passed away, I more or less became mother until our father married Betsy. But after we moved to Springfield, I started inviting my sisters one by one to Springfield so they could meet eligible young men. Because in Springfield at that time, young men out married outnumbered the young ladies 10 to 1. So I knew that they would probably be able to snatch a pretty good husband. First I invited Francis, then Anne, and then Mary. It was in Mary's house, or in our house where Mary and Mr. Lincoln was born, or were married. I had six children. Only four of them survived uh, to adulthood. Um, a little bit more, I'll tell you a little bit more about me that's not even on there. I like to talk about myself, so I will do that. Uh, my husband, Lillian, I must talk about him. He and Mr. Lincoln were at one time friends. They were part of the Illinois legislature together on the Whig Party. But then when the Whig Party broke up, and most nearly everyone then went to the new Republican Party. However, Ninian did not and became a Democrat, uh, much to Mr. Lincoln's chagrin. He didn't understand why. But even Ninian, when it came time to Mr. Lincoln's elections and political endeavors, Ninian couldn't even bring himself to vote for Mr. Lincoln, even though they were brothers-in-law. And Ninian was kind of a thorn in Mr. Lincoln's side after Mr. Lincoln became president. And maybe I'll go into a little more about that at a later time, but I'll just put a bug in your ear and say that uh, I think this may even be done today. Uh, when government contracts are given out, sometimes no bid contracts, that is what happened with my husband, Ninian. I should be embarrassed to talk about it, but it is part of history. And Ninian um, kind of went down in history for not doing things quite on the up and up and made some people mad and uh, very thoroughly embarrassed Mr. Lincoln while he was in the White House. So, a lot of things happened in my home. Not only did Mary and Mr. Lincoln get married in my home, but years later, when Mary's insanity trial took place, and I may touch upon that a little bit later also, she was in Bellevue Place in Batavia, Illinois, after an insanity trial. Now, the reason why the insanity trial took place was because she had been doing some very odd things that her son Robert was very concerned about. 
and a trial took place in order for him to be able to control her money because he found out that she was carrying $57,000 of stocks and bonds sewed into her petticoat. And the only way someone could become a conservator of someone's estate was to have them deemed insane. And in order to do that, there had to be a trial. So there was a trial. Mary was, the verdict was she was insane. And Robert didn't want her just to go to the county hospital for the insane. He wanted her to go to a very nice house for the insane, <laughs> which was in Batavia, Illinois, Dr. Patterson's house called Bellevue Place. She was only there a few months, and with the help of Myra uh, Bradwell, who was the first woman in Illinois to pass the bar, but not allowed to practice because women weren't allowed to practice law at that time, um, she basically sent out a letter campaign on, on Mary's behalf. And with all going back and forth, back and forth, she wrote to me and said that if I would agree to give Mary a home, she could get out of Bellevue Place, and they didn't think that that was a place that she should be. I really wasn't quite sure if I was up to taking care of Mary, because I knew how Mary could be. But being the loving mother type, I said, bring her to me. So she came and lived with me then for another year. Then years went by, more and more things happened to Mary, which I'll get into when I talk about Mary. But Mary does spend her final days in my home. She passes away in, on July 16th, 1882 in my home. And then I finally pass away. After years of very hard work and taking care of everyone, I passed away in February of 18, 1888 at the age of 75. I bet our tech guy left, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> it worked at home. about our father's first family. These, we are all the children of, of Robert and Eliza. Uh, the second child that's born is Frances. And um, she's another, she was one of the first sisters that I invited to come to my house to find a husband, which she did. She met Mr. William Wallace, M William Smith Wallace, who was a physician there in Springfield and owned a drugstore. Uh, both of them together actually attended Lincoln's first inaugural, uh, as did I and some other family members. After the war broke out, uh, Dr. Wallace was made a paymaster in the Union Army um, and actually did a very, very good job. But because of uh, going around to all the different camps during the Civil War, he was uh, exposed to a lot of camp diseases and became very sick and for several years suffered uh, with a lot of the ailments uh, from some of the things that the diseases and things that he got. I won't go into detail about what he uh, did come down with. A lady doesn't speak of such things, but eventually it did kill him and that made um, Francis a widow uh, in 1867. Now the Todds, we're kind of an unusual lot as far as our personalities. We can be very, very stubborn. We can have a very quick tongue. We can be very unforgiving. Or we could be very forgiving after we found out exactly what we had said to hurt someone's feelings. Mary was very good at this. She had a very quick tongue and could cut someone to shreds. 
But then she felt bad about it afterwards. Uh, a couple of our other sisters were just the same, but sometimes weren't as forgiving or felt as bad. Now, Frances was a bit of a cold and very reserved person. She wasn't as vivacious as Mary was. They were a, a lot different in that respect. Uh, but after uh, Dr. Wallace passes away in 1867, she pretty much lives along. And after her children are, are grown, then she um, just kind of secludes herself in her own little cottage. And then she dies uh, at a very elderly age for someone that in, in that time period, then in 1899. I do not have a photo of Levi. And I'm going to tell you right now to warn you, the sisters in my family fared much better than my brothers did. I was telling you a little bit about the personalities of the brothers, uh, or of the Todd family, but the brothers had um, infamous personalities, uh, which made the papers uh, taken to court a lot. They were pretty well known and made the Todd name very well known. And Levi, was the first one. Levi really never had a profession. When our father was living, he was pretty much our father's first lieutenant and pretty much followed orders that our father would give him. But when our father died in 1849, Levi lost his compass. He wasn't sure what to do. Um, he, he had no orders to do. He didn't uh, know how to find something to do. He didn't have that creativity to actually start and carry on a business. So he floundered horribly. He wasn't good with money, which could have been another family trait, because Mary was horrible with money. One thing that he thought he could do easily to achieve money was he tried suing people. He thought by taking them to court on frivolous things, he might be able to get some money out of them. But more often than not, he found himself on the other side of the aisle, and he was the one being sued. He was always uh, in want of money. Uh, his wife, Louisa, divorced him in 1859 for habit of drunkenness, which was another Todd male trait and a cruel and inhumane manner. The Todd's also had a very vicious temper. And when you mix a bad temper with a lot of Kentucky bourbon, those don't mix very well. He was the only brother of ours that really was a unionist, but he never, he never served. Uh, he uh, even tried asking for money from Mr. Lincoln, even while Mr. Lincoln was, was in the White House. But Mr. Lincoln would only send advice back to him instead of money. And after a while, uh, Levi did die alone in 1864 of utter want and destitution. And now comes Mary. Oh. I'm glad we didn't have these things around in the 1850s. <laughs> Mary. I talked a lot about Mary, obviously, when I was here the last time. And I talked and talked and talked, so I won't go into great detail about her, even though her life was extremely interesting yet very, very tragic. Uh, basically, the things that we already know, but let me touch upon the sadness and the tragedy that Mary did suffer during her life. And that might make you, or help you to understand a little bit more about what happened to her. But as you know, she did suffer many, many losses. Her first son, Eddie, died in 1850, or 1850, and then um, the second child, Willie, when they were in the White House in 1862. Uh, succumbed to typhoid fever. And with the two of them, Mary almost went berserk. 
Uh, she really did change about that time. Mr. Lincoln, with his um, advice to Robert, Robert wrote me a letter and asked me to come to Washington, D.C. to care for Mary. Nobody could do anything for her after Willie had passed away. She would stay in her bed for days and days and days. She would have fits of screaming and then collapse into a coma or go into seizures because of the sobbing that she had. Uh, it was very hard to, to get through to her. And I was there for a couple of months. But finally, I think what did it was Mr. Lincoln finally took Mary over to the window and showed her on the hill there was a building. And he said, Mary, I'm afraid if you do not get any better, we are going to have to send you. And that place was uh, an asylum for the insane. And I told her that she needs to get better for Tad's sake. Tad was the, the fourth son after Robert, Eddie, Willie, and then Tad. Then Tad passed away at the age of 18. In between that time, Mary suffered the most tragic loss of all. On April 15, 1865, as everyone knows, Mr. Lincoln was assassinated in Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth. Mary wasn't even allowed to say goodbye to Mr. Lincoln because of her sobbing and screaming. It uh, distracted the doctors and everyone there trying to help Mr. Lincoln. And William uh, Stanton had ordered her out of the room. So she didn't even realize that he had died. And there again, she goes into deep, deep grieving and mourning. And it's very hard to understand a woman who has had such tragedies, so close uh, tragedies, and how she could really hold it together. But Mary was a very, had a very fragile uh, mind and it was very, very difficult for her to get much better uh, because of her losses. She had a lot of physical ailments. She suffered from migraine headaches since she was a child. She suffered from neuralgia. And she suffered from injuries that she sustained in a very, very difficult delivery uh, mm -hmm. when Tad was born. So it is my feeling that Mary uh, self-medicated herself quite a bit. She took a lot of laudanum to help the pain. She had back pain that only laudanum would help. She would also mix it with chloral hydrate to help her sleep. And the two of those mixed together is not a very good combination. And this is another thing that leads up to her insanity trial. Robert knows how she's been acting, and he thinks this is very strange. Plus, he's very much embarrassed by her actions, because he's an up-and-coming lawyer in Chicago. And he can't have her, his mother uh, running out of her, motel, her hotel room uh, in just her underwear, or telling people that she's hearing voices from the walls. She ex exclaimed to one person that, she thought an old Indian chief was pulling wires through her eyes. Now, to me, that sounds like a migraine headache. And so she medicated herself with that. So the mixture of some of these medications could easily lead to hallucinations or hearing things or just acting a little more bizarre. And that's what led up, basically, to her insanity trial. After she lives, uh, or after uh, Mr. Lincoln is assassinated, uh, her and Tad do move to Europe. Uh, I have on here that she has lived in Europe twice. She goes with Tad after the assassination, lives for several years in Germany. And Tad is educated there. Uh, while they are gone, Robert, her oldest son, who has married Mary Harlan, who was the senator of, uh, daughter of Senator Harlan from Iowa, 
they have a baby girl while she's in Germany. And they get a little bit, a little bit homesick. Cad really wants to see his, his new niece. And of course, Mary is dying to see her new granddaughter. She always wanted to have a girl, only had boys. So this new granddaughter was very, very special. So in 1871, they decided to come home. Ted had a sniffle when he was in Germany, but that sniffle turned into something of more concern. Because of the sea air on the trip home, he developed pleurisy. So in July of 1871, Tad passes away. And Tad was Mary's full-time companion. He helped her with everything. And now she definitely has lost her way. And during the time between her, uh, the time between Tad dies and ins her insanity trial, she lives in about 10 different cities. She just wanders from city to city to city. She wants to be among strangers, but she can't quite settle down. She's always worried about money, yet she's spending it ferociously. ferociously. Uh, she's a hot shopaholic. And that was another thing that people thought were, was quite strange, was her uh, spending money when she would tell people that she was poor and didn't have any. So, um, like I said, she, um, she does come home to my house after her insanity trial is, is over and then moves back after a year. She has to go through another trial when she was living at my house. She had difficulty with wanting to spend her money. Robert had full control over it. And every time she wanted a new shawl or a new bonnet, she had to ask Robert for permission. And she didn't like that one bit. Even Ninian uh, went to Robert on her behalf. And we really felt that she was doing much, much better. Uh, so we agreed that after a year, she should be able to control her money again. But there needed to be another trial. So there was, and she was deemed to reason. Well, Mary couldn't wait to get out of Chicago. She headed straight back to Europe and moved to France. And that's where she was and stayed until 1881, when my grandson, Louis, went to meet her in New York. Now, there's an interesting story about her trip home from Germany. It was very rough seas, and the, the ship was tossing and turning, and she was trying to get back to her room where she was staying. But the ship suddenly tossed because of a, a wave, and there was a woman standing directly behind Mary. But Mary was getting ready to um, descend some stairs. But the ship tossed her forward, and just as she was about ready to fall down the stairs, this woman behind her grabbed her by her skirt and pulled her up and said, Madam, you could have been killed. But Mary just said, it wasn't the Lord's will today. The woman that pulled her back was none other than Sarah Bernhardt, the famous actress. She was on her way to New York for her first United States performances. Well, the ship pulled into New York, and Mary was waiting there. This throng, this crowd was there, waving and cheering. And for a moment, she really thought, I'm home. Unfortunately, that crowd was there for Sarah Bernhardt, not for her. She uh, debarked the plane, or the, the uh, boat, and uh, no one knew that she was there. Uh, Lewis went to meet her, and for a time she lived in New York to try a new treatment for her back problems. Uh, it was like electric therapy. It was something brand new, and she wanted to try it and to try some of the new baths that the doctors were recommending. But then she did come home to my house, and there she just pretty much secluded herself in the upstairs room that I had for her uh, earlier, and another room right across the hall 
where she brought back her 64 trunks full of clothing. 64 trunks of clothing that she never wore. She only wore a few black dresses. She always wore black uh, after Willie was born. But all these trunks had beautiful clothing in them. And in the evenings, I could hear her above walking, pacing, going through all those trunks and remembering her life as it was. I lost a good Irish girl because of that, whose room was underneath the room that had the 64 trunks because the ceiling started to bow because of the weight of the trunks mm -hmm. and she refused to sleep in that room. Next is our sister Anne. Anne was the, the fourth sister to move to Springfield and she also met a husband. I was very good at matchmaking. She meets and marries Clark Smith who was a very successful <coughs> store owner and merchant. And his store advertised that he had the finest ladies' garments in the whole state of Illinois. And because he was very good at buying things for his store and thought he knew the latest fashions, he did a company marry on her very first shopping trip to Springfield, uh, to um, New York. After Mr. Lincoln won the presidential election in 1860, uh, of course, Mary had a lot to prove. Uh, the people of the South kind of saw her as a traitor, and the people of the North saw her as a spy. And everybody thought that the Lincolns were country bumpkins from the West. So she had a lot to show them that she was no country bumpkin, and either was her husband. So she wanted to buy the very finest clothing she could out east. And then she also furnished the executive mansion with the, the most magnificent furnishings. The White House at the time, which was called the executive mansion then, it had truly been the people's house. People could just walk in anytime. Uh, they didn't have a souvenir shop at that time, but they wanted to take a souvenir home. So what they would do would be just to take a little vase off of the, the table. Then it got to be, they would snip a tassel from the curtains or snip something from the carpeting. The furniture was probably there since the very, very first presidential resident and was broken, it was threadbare. I was there at the inaugural and I was appalled at the conditions of the inside of the executive mansion. So Mary had something, a goal. She was going to furnish the house. So uh, Anne's husband accompanied her on these shopping trips. Like a Todd, Anne had a very quick temper and a tongue to match. <coughs> and her and Mary didn't always get along. So min for many, many years, uh, Mary and Anne didn't speak. Actually, for many, many years, none of us spoke to Mary. I was probably the one that was on her best side, but Frances and Anne were the siblings that, let's say, if you had a sister or brother that you told them not to do something, that they wouldn't be good at it, but they went ahead and did it anyway, and they succeeded beyond their wildest imaginations, there might just be a little bit of envy and jealousy there. And that's what happened between Mary and her sisters. None of us wanted Mary to, to marry Mr. Lincoln. We didn't think that Mr. Lincoln could keep Mary uh, in the, the, the way she was accustomed, the life that she, this lifestyle that she was accustomed to, because we were raised in a very wealthy household. And Mr. Lincoln didn't have a penny to his name. And we just thought that there was no way that they would ever get along. But they did, and Mr. Lincoln proved all of us wrong, which was kind of a bit of an embarrassment to some of my sisters. Uh, Anne, however, she was an expert seamstress. 
she won many, many awards with her needlework and quilts. And that's what she did with her time and traveled a lot uh, to Cincinnati to buy new patterns and material. Uh, but the store that the Smiths owned, they sold in 1870. And they moved out west. And Anne then passed away while she lived in California in 1891. Our baby brother, George Rogers Clark. He was the baby that was born just the day before our mother passed away. And I think he always carried that guilt with him all of his life. He knew he was the cause of his mother's death. But he's a very smart man. He attended uh, Center College, and graduated in 1843 and then in Transylvania Medical School in 1848. Now, when our father passed away in 1849, our father was a lawyer. He knew he was very, very sick with the cholera. So he waited to the last minute to try to draft his will. The time was running out. He had one signature on it, but in Kentucky, you needed two signatures. Our stepmother, Betsy, didn't realize that. She thought that she would be getting half of his estate, and the other half would be divided among the 14 children. When George found out that he was only going to get 1 14th of half of that, he was livid. So he contested the will. He found out that there was only one signature and took it to court and George won. You can imagine how our stepmother Betsy must have felt about that. Uh, like all the other Todd boys, he was a very heavy drinker. That Kentucky bourbon gets around a lot. And he also had, of course, a very bad temper, which made him not real likable. He also had some physical problems. He suffered from myopia, and had very bad eyesight, and he stuttered. So he was a little hard to understand at times. But he did marry a lady named Ann Curry, and they had a daughter named Maddie Dee, who was born in 1853. Now, even though George had become a pretty successful surgeon and was very skilled, he wasn't always proper and to do things legally. And Anne's father one night caught him forging documents. And Anne's father was also a lawyer. And he told him to get out and literally chased him out of town. So, uh, of course, Anne divorced him for mental cruelty. There's more on George. <laughs> He was awarded a commission as a surgeon for the Confederate Army because he was such a skilled surgeon and the Army needed the best surgeons they could get. Um, there was one time in a drunken rage out in public, George started with the foulest language anyone had ever heard come out of someone's mouth, uh, slandering the South and the government of the South. So he was immediately arrested right there on the spot. But they happened to find a letter in his pocket from Abraham Lincoln, which got him into even more trouble. So what he said to try to get himself out of it was that he considered Lincoln one of the greatest scoundrels unhung. And that helped him a little bit, and they let him go. In July of 1863, he did accompany General Lee on their march to Gettysburg. On their way, even though he is a skilled surgeon, on, his, on the way, he manages with a couple of other soldiers to loot and raid every private home that they came upon, stealing everything they could get their hands on. Uh, 
But during the, the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, like I said, he's a very skilled surgeon and worked tirelessly throughout those three days of battle. And he credits himself with over 700 amputations during those three days. And he is the first one to ever be able to successfully amputate at the hip joint, which was, they thought was impossible. But he was the first surgeon ever to be able to do that. In 1864, then he's transferred and put in charge of the Rikersville Hospital just outside of Charleston. Um, now remember, you have to keep in mind, he's supposed to be a doctor. He's there to make people well and to heal them and make them feel better. But he did not like Yankee prisoners or Yankee wounded. And due to his temper and drunkenness, he was very abusive to federal wounded and actually caused the death of one officer after kicking and beating him. He died the next day. And when someone asked him about it, he said, that's OK, because he meant to kill the son of a bitch the next day anyway. And this is my brother, the physician. I have a few quotes here that I would like to read. These are quotes from some of the prisoners at Rikersville Hospital uh, that unfortunately came in contact with George. A more rabid secessionist was nowhere to be found. He would come around among the men and kick and abuse them without trying to benefit their condition in the least. Never heard a man capable of using such volleys of profane and obscene language as this surgeon, who claimed to be a brother of Miss, Mrs. Lincoln. Yet, George goes on. At the end of the war, George helped loot a Confederate treasury card. There he goes again with the looting, uh, much like he did for the homes outside Gettysburg. But somehow, he managed to find a woman that would marry him, Martha Lyles. He was about 50 years old at this time, and Martha was 16 years younger. And they had a son that they named George Jr. After the war, he did have a very successful medical practice in Barneswell, South Carolina. And then Martha dies in 1889. Unfortunately, George kind of goes out in his lifetime on a very, even more negative note. In 1892, he's arrested and indicted for the death of a young woman and her baby following a botched abortion that was performed by George. <coughs> so he didn't fare very well. Uh, after Martha dies, George Jr. couldn't get along with his father very well. And he leaves. <coughs> and in George's will, he leaves everything, his house, everything he owns, to a neighbor, not to George Jr. So George dies alone in 1902. We're not sure if it was intentional or not, but it was an overdose of self-administered chloroform. <coughs> now that ended the children of Robert and Eliza, uh, Robert's first family. Then in 18. 26, he does marry Betsy Humphreys. He actually proposes to Betsy just five months after Eliza's death, which is not proper etiquette. And our grandmother Parker was livid when she heard this. Uh, she couldn't really say anything bad uh, against Robert, since Robert is still pretty much her son-in-law because he has her grandchildren. He couldn't turn the children against him, but she could pretty much badmouth Betsy uh, in, in the minds of, of the children, and which she did quite well. 
she was a, a very bitter mother-in-law and didn't take to, to Betsy uh, very well at all. But Betsy knew that that wasn't proper etiquette. She didn't want tongues wagging or talking about her because she married a widow much too early. So after she does say yes to his proposal, she leaves. And they start a letter writing campaign. And he writes letter after letter, you know, to please come home. I think we need to get married. But basically, he had these children that he wanted a wife to take care of. So after that respectable amount of time, Betsy does come home and they do get married um, later on, about uh, oh, over a year, year, three months, something like that, after, after um, Eliza has passed away. And these are the children that they start having soon after they're married. The first one is another infant son that our father tried to name after him for the second time and it didn't work. So they stopped trying to use the name Robert. It wasn't very good luck. But ironically, the next Robert Todd was Mary and Abraham Lincoln's first son, and he was the only son to survive adulthood. So a little irony there. Ma Margaret was born in 1828, Sam in 1830, David, 1832, Martha, 1833, Emily, 1836, Alex, 1839, Elodie, 1840, and finally Catherine in 1841. And I seriously think that the only reason why Catherine was the last child is because Betsy mercifully went into menopause and couldn't have any more children. calling, I will never say half-siblings, uh, half-brothers, half-sisters. We are all brothers and sisters. We all have the same father. So we never refer to each other as our half-sister or our half-brother. So if I still say my sister or my brother, that, that is why. She was the first born of the Humphrey Todds after uh, Robert Todd was born. She married Charles Henry uh, Kellogg in 1847 and moved to Cincinnati. They attended Lincoln's first inaugural and actually stayed in the White House. And like a lot of people that time after Lincoln is, uh, has taken office, he is inundated with office seekers. And the Todds are right there among them. Like uh, our sister, and her, uh, Francis, her husband, was given a paymaster's position in the Union Army. And Mr. Lincoln wanted to give Union positions for a lot of his Todd relatives. Um, some of them he really, really wanted because he really thought they were good for the job and he liked them, but they went with the side of the South. Um, and Charles was, was no different. He was really, really hoping for a lucrative position in the government. But when Mr. Lincoln got word that he was uh, overheard um, saying very complimentary things about the South and the Southern cause, Mr. Lincoln declined, declined his, um, his application uh, for wanting a, a position and Clark actually committed actual treason because when the war started, he did go south and he followed a lot of the troops and helped in a lot of the southern hospitals to help the southern soldiers. Uh, but then came back to Cincinnati um, and lived for a while. But then they both moved to Florida later on where Clark died in Tampa. And Margaret lived to be quite a bit older too. Uh, she finally dies in a Daytona hotel room in 1904. Okay, Good time to break.
Okay, uh, we're going to take a little break here, and we usually do about five minutes, so you're allowed to visit and think up a lot of questions. Uh, actually, the outfit that I have on, uh, there, I can get two events out of it. Okay. I have a skirt, and this has two tops. Two tops. I am wearing what's called a, a day bodice. Okay. Um, it has pagoda sleeves. Pagoda sleeves. This is called pagoda sleeves. Okay. And the sleeves under this are called under sleeves. Okay. They are, they come off. Oh, they do? Yeah, they are There's, not attached. They're not attached. No. They oh, end yeah. right that. here with Look the drawstring. So it's very easy to just take these off and just wash the sleeves without having to wash the whole top. Very good. Um, now the... The other top that came with this yes. was a ball gown bodice. Okay. And it has short sleeves and it's always off the collar. Because in the evening, okay. when you would go to a ball, mm -hmm. that's when you were allowed to show a little skin. Oh. So you would wear very short sleeves okay. and um, show a lot of the show bosom, of, actually. Okay. And All women right. did that. All and right. actually the hair was, you didn't have to have it pulled back into a bun. It could be, it would come down in the evening too. Okay. Now, underneath, I have okay. a hoop skirt on with a petticoat okay. over it. All right. Look at that. That's all one. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is made out of plastic now. No. It would have been made out of whale bone or okay. something like that. Yes. Or it would have been called a cage crinoline, which just had the hoops with straps of cotton. Oh, the vertical type. Oh, right. Then. Okay. And that would just hold it in instead of having it all solid. But to kind okay. of hide the... Uh, yeah. The, the outline of this, then you would wear okay, a sure. petticoat. I'll be back on. Now, underneath that. Oh, more to go. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I have a chemise. Chemise, okay. Yes, which is like a slip. Okay. And under that, okay. I have my bloomers. The uh, bloomers. Yes. They, they don't call them pantaloons, they call them bloomers. Pantalets, huh? yeah. Actually, they're called pantalets. <laughs> pantalets? Yes. Okay. Very good. So, and then of course my corset, but I'm not going to show you my corset. That's, <laughs> That's going a little too far. <laughs> and I got to ask a question pertaining to your little bonnet. I noticed there's a net for your hair. Is that yes. special uh, name for that? The, the hair net was very popular in the 1860s to keep the hair off of, because you always had long hair. Some okay. women did have short. All right. Um, but not very many. Okay. Uh, but to keep your long hair up off the neck to keep cool. Yeah. Uh, now I am wearing a wig because I have very short hair underneath okay. this. Okay. All right. Uh, but yeah, you would you Looks would wear like... something to keep your hair back. Sure. Uh, and most of the time, a lady always wore gloves. Okay. If you were out riding, uh, you would you would mostly have kit or okay. leather gloves. But since I'm inside, I just have the fingerless what they call mitts okay. and a lot of sometimes what I heard was younger ladies didn't always wear these only the older ladies did okay. but I'll, I'll admit I think I'm in that older generation so I have a right to qualify for that yeah, I qualify yeah. for wearing the mitts okay. so well, I do thank you very much for taking the time to explain this and uh, you know, I'm really appreciate it so. very much and you fit the, uh, the style very nicely thank you very much thank you. now the next child in line is Samuel Brown Todd. After our father passes away in 1849, he moves to New Orleans to work on an uncle's sugar plantation. And there he meets his wife, Clelly Cecile Royer, in 1856. And they marry, and they have three children. He's another brother that sided with the South. He joined Company H of the Crescent Regiment there outside New Orleans at the age of 32. However, he didn't last very long. He was only in service for a couple of months, and he was fatally shot on the second day of the Battle of at Shiloh. And because he's the first Todd death, or first Todd casualty of the war, um, papers all over the country wrote <coughs> articles about him. And I have a few of those here. It's very interesting how some of them portrayed his death. 
This came from the Macon Daily Telegraph. Sam died in defense of his country against the hireling <coughs> invaders whom the husband of his sister, Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, sent to desolate our country and dishonor our people. The New Orleans Delta wrote, it must be a pleasant reflection to Mrs. Lincoln amid her vulgar attempts to ape royal fashions with her balls and soirees at the federal capital to know that a gallant brother should have thus fallen by the hands of her husband's mercenaries. And this is from the Georgia Chronicle and Sentinel. The lady of the White House holds high revelry after the recent decease of her own son, and while her own brothers are pouring out the blood they derived from a common parent in the defense of the soil of her and their ancestors. So you see, the South was not very supportive of Mrs. Lincoln at all, even though she was a young Kentucky belle. <coughs> David. David is very interesting. He is what I would call the rogue of the Todd clan. At the age of 14, he runs away from home and joins in the fight in 1846 in the Mexican War. After that, he decides to go up to California in 1849 to join in the gold rush. By 1851, we find him down fighting in the Chilean Revolution. He's all over. He loves to get into a good scrap. He also has a body full of tattoos. And we find him back in New Orleans in 1857 to 1861, and he's actually working a job at the W.W. W. Crane and Company, which is a carriage-making company. Uh, today, he would probably be known as a used car salesman. <laughs> then, on May 1st, 1861, because of his vast experience in the military, he secured a first lieutenancy with the Confederate Army. But then he's placed in charge of the Richmond prison system. Do you remember our brother George? David was very much like George. He had a temper. He loved drinking. And of course, the two don't go very well. Plus, he had a hatred for Yankees. And being in charge of a federal prison full of federal prisoners, David had a field day. If anyone knows anything about Andersonville, the infamous prison in Georgia, the commandant of Andersonville was Henry Word. Henry Wirtz was David's second in command. And he learned a thing or two from David while being his assistant in Richmond. And as you know, too, Henry Wirtz, because of his actions or inactions in Andersonville, he was the only one uh, put on trial and actually executed for war crimes. For some reason, David took personal delight in human blood and suffering. If you look at his photograph, the symbol of authority was that sword. One man said he would come with it drawn and leave with it bloody. For the minor, the most minor infractions, that a prisoner could, have, could uh, be guilty of doing, such as not falling into line quick enough or not putting out the light, your candle quick enough, could be deadly. David, a uh, couple of stories that I heard later, that one man who didn't fall into line fast enough got a whack right across the face with the blunt 
side of his sword. But he fared better than the prisoner who didn't put out his candle fast enough. David's sword went right through his thigh as punishment for not putting out the candle fast enough. He was only in, in charge of the prison system for barely two months. But during those two months, he was drunk most of the time. And he seemed to enjoy every opportunity to inflict, inflict pain and indignity on his prisoners, which also included dead prisoners. He was put on trial and relieved of duty on August 18, 1861, for actually kicking a Yankee corpse into a Richmond street. What happened there was the prison was filthy. For some of the punishments that he would inflict on the prisoners would be not to let them go to the latrine. Sometimes if you wanted, if you needed to, you could pay a guard or you could pay David and you might be able to go. He instituted a policy that no prisoner be allowed to use the latrine after dark. And if you needed to use the latrine, you had to go with a guard. And that's where bribing kind of came into play. But if you remember the diseases and the sicknesses that these four boys had, most of them intestinal diseases, and they weren't allowed to go to the bathroom, the areas where they slept were filthy. And in some cases, men that were forced to lie in their own fill became crazy. But then David decided he was going to clean up the prison. And that meant taking out the dead people. So after they had thought they had removed all the dead prisoners at this one point, David went back to his home. When the guards went back to where they had been, in the meantime, another prisoner had died. They didn't know what to do. They thought, let's take him over to the commandant's home, and we'll find out what we should do with this body. Well, they couldn't knock on the door and carry the body at the same time, so they dropped the body right there on his front porch couldn't get anyone to come to the door and left. Well, when David discovered the dead body on his front porch, he kicked it into the street, and there it lay for another day or so. Now, the citizens of Richmond, they didn't think very highly of federal prisoners anyway, but this topped everything. Even they thought that you know, a Yankee, a good Yankee is a dead Yankee, but a dead Yankee at least deserved some respect. So he was put on trial and relieved of that duty after just two months. He then joined the 1st Kentucky uh, after um, Shiloh and became a captain in, the, in Company A, 22nd Louisiana, and then fought at Vicksburg, where he was captured, but during a prisoner exchange program, uh, he was exchanged and actually paroled for a time. But then right after, right about the end of the war, he married Susie Williamson, another woman that I can't understand why she would marry a man like my brother. And they settled in Huntsville, Alabama. And actually David becomes uh, a good merchant uh, but because of the inheritance that Susie had, um, he just lives off of her inheritance. In 1869, during, during congressional hearings of prisoner abuse cases, believe it or not, his name is brought up many, many times. But where that went, no one really knows. But then he did die on July 30th, 1871 at the age of 39. Martha. Martha is 
living in Selma, Alabama. She marries Clement White at the age of 17. And Clement is a physician there in Selma. Uh, Matt, as we all called her, she actually attended Jefferson Davis's inaugural the same time I'm attending Mr. Lincoln's inaugural. Like the other Todd sisters, she has a very vicious and cutting tongue and oftentimes doesn't get along with her other siblings. But in 1864, she was a topic of conversation in a flurry of newspaper articles and stories about her smuggling contraband into the South, but she was exonerated. And what really happened, she made it as far north as Washington, D.C., and was carrying several trunks with her. And because she was the president's uh, sister-in-law, how it really happened was that um, she was stopped, but they knew that she was the sister-in-law of Mr. Lincoln, and uh, was let, uh, was, and, and she had a pass, I forgot, she had a pass, from Mr. Lincoln and was let go, but there were some papers that totally blew the story out of proportion. That she was carrying many, many things, including quinine and other things to take down the South, including uh, j uh, jackets and uniforms with gold buttons. And of course, gold was a big commodity at that time. But there was a hearing and she was completely exonerated because the man that was there that heard everything um, um, exonerated her. But it was a huge embarrassment to Mr. Lincoln in the White House that here another Todd is in the papers. But Anna dies in Anna, Illinois, uh, or Martha dies in Anna, Illinois in 1868. Uh, no one really knows what she died of at the age of 35. Emily. Emily was probably a lot like Mary as far as personality, very vivacious, uh, very sweet. She was very, very young when the Lincolns lived in Springfield. But Mr. Lincoln called her little sister throughout her whole, or his life, he always called her little sister. She married Benjamin Hardin Helm in March of 1856. And the Lincolns knew Benjamin. They knew him and thought very highly of him. And Mr. Lincoln wanted to give him a federal position. But because he was a true Kentuckian, he becomes a brigadier general in the Confederate Army. He's in several battles, but he finally is killed at the Battle of Chickamauga in 1863 and leaves Emily and her three children uh, alone. Now, there is a story about after she becomes a widow, she's desperately trying to get home to Betsy. And because of the war, it's very hard to obtain a pass. It's very hard to travel anywhere. And she can't get home. She gets as far as Fortress Monroe. And in order to go north, she must claim um, allegiance to the, to the United States, which she refuses to do, because that would be a blow to her husband, who died for the Confederacy. So she refuses. They don't know what to do with her. So they do wire. Mr. Lincoln, because they knew that Emily was his sister-in-law. And Mr. Lincoln wires back, send her to me. So Emily and her three children actually stay in the White House for about a week. But it's, as you can understand, it's very awkward. Uh, Willie has been gone for about a year, and Mary is still grieving over Willie. And of course, Emily is grieving over Ben. But other people don't like the fact that we have a Confederate widow. 
in the White House. And it's very awkward for her, and she stays about a week, and then she does get a pass to, to make it back to Lexington to be with Betsy. Um, actually, she lives quite a long time. She lives to the age of 93 and passes away in 1930. Her daughter, Catherine, uh, writes the first biography about Mary due to uh, Emily's profuse di diary writing. She writes in her diary daily, and she accumulates quite a bit of material. And that was one of the very first uh, sympathetic, uh, loving views of Mary that had been pu pub published at that time. Alex. He is the baby brother, and he's very much coddled by all of his older sisters. But there was a story about uh, a nurse that Betsy had hired to help her take care of her ever-growing brood. And um, after a while, they suspected some abuse by this nurse on Alex. Uh, the story says that she would actually hold him upside down until his face turned blue. So after that, everyone became um, very tight with and protective over, over Alex. And he joins the Confederate Army and thinks he's in a safe place because he is pretty much an aide to Emily's husband, Ben. But it doesn't take long, and poor Alex is actually killed by friendly fire just outside of Baton Rouge in 1862, and he was only 23. And Elodie. Elodie is the second to the last one. She wrote a lot in her diary also, and we have a lot of information uh, from what she had written uh, from the Deep South. And she meets her husband, Nathaniel, while she is visiting Martha in Selma. And she goes with uh, Martha to Jefferson Davis's inaugural also. And were actually the bells of the ball. Everyone wanted to know them because they knew that they were Mr. Lincoln's sister-in-laws. Um, after the war broke out, though, she was unable to return to Lexington because it was very difficult to travel, and passes were almost impossible to obtain. So she was pretty much stranded in Selma for two years until she was finally able to make it back to Lexington to be with Betsy. And then she marries uh, Nathaniel Dawson in 1862 and gives birth to Alex in 1863, and she names him after their brother that had just been killed in Baton Rouge, but there again, maybe she shouldn't have named him that because the baby only lived a week. Then she gave birth in 1864 and a third child in 1869, and she knew that, I think she understood that something was wrong, and um, Nathaniel should have been a little more careful also because his first two wives died giving birth. So to take a third wife and to take that chance, uh, I was just very much surprised that he wouldn't uh, let Elodie um, take those chances. But she becomes pregnant again in 1877, but proves to be a very, very difficult pregnancy. And because of the pain uh, that she suffers throughout this pregnancy, she is given morphine quite a bit to the point where they can't rouse her. And then uh, she gives birth then to a stillborn baby in 1877 and passes away shortly after. And she was only 37. Kitty. Kitty is the last one. She is the ninth and final child of Robert and Betsy. Uh, 
She was one of the few of Betty's children to actually, along with Emily, to actually visit the Lincolns when they live in Springfield. Most of the time, we didn't see too much of Betsy's children, especially, obviously, during the war because our families were torn apart. But she remained unmarried, living there in Selma uh, throughout the war. But then she meets William Wallace Hur in 1866. And then also, she is unlucky in 1875, after giving birth to her fifth child, she dies at the age of 33. Here's a little synopsis of our stepmother, Betsy. She delivers nine babies in 15 years. After Robert dies in 1849, she loses her home and personal belongings when his will is contested by George. And I mentioned that earlier, <coughs> what they decided to do then, instead of Betsy getting half and the other children splitting up the other half, everything was liquidated. <coughs> everything. The home, even her own personal belongings that she brought into the marriage, George insisted to be sold. Everything. And then at the sale of all that, then things were divided up. So because of this, as you can imagine, George was not liked by any of Betsy's children for the rest of their lives. She loses two of her sons and a son-in-law. They're killed in action for the Confederacy. Uh, she moves temporarily to Selma for a while, uh, looking for her, her children that are there. Um, but things were really bad down there, and she manages to move back up to Lexington where it's safer. But after the war, in 1874, she actually moves across the Ohio River into Indiana, where she dies in Madison. Emily has moved there. Emily is quite talented, musically and artistically, and she moves to Madison because of a conservatory there where she actually studies and uh, was also the organist at the Presbyterian Church in Madison. But after Emily, after Betsy passes away, instead of a monument to herself in her will, she has directed that a 12-foot obelisk monument be erected over her grave with her son's names on it to honor their lives that they sacrificed for the Confederacy. This is a letter, and I'll end on this note, a letter that Elodie wrote to Nathaniel before they were married in 1861. And I think it pretty much sums up the problem that the Todd family had during the war. You see, I am sad today, and you may be right in thinking that I take the cares and troubles of my family to heart too much, but I have tried in every way to drive them from me, and I cannot. Though I employ every moment and take no time for thought, yet they find their way to me. Would to heaven we never had the occasion for this unnatural war. Surely there is no other family in the land placed in the exact situation of ours. And I hope there will never be another so unfortunate as to be so surrounded by trials so numerous. And that's okay, what I'm, what I'm going to do now... We're going to open it up for questions, and when you ask the question, I'm going to ask that you state your name first, and we're going to pass the microphone down. And seeing I have the microphone, I'm going to ask her to explain her garb in front of everybody here. Oh. Okay. And who's ever got a question, you want to put your hand up so I can get the mic back by you? I can wait. I'm patient. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, what I'm wearing tonight actually does double duty. Uh, I don't know if you remember the postcard that was sent out. Uh, this is the skirt that I was wearing a ball gown bodice. So I could wear it in the evening 
and I could wear it during the day. So this is what would be called a, a day bodice. It has pagoda sleeves, which was very, very popular in the 1850s and 60s. But this is what is a little unusual. These are called undersleeves, and they tie at the top. So you don't have to wash the whole bodice. Mm -hmm. You just take the sleeves off and wash them. And of course, everything is made of cotton. Uh, this is a silk taffeta. Um, I will show a little bit underneath here. That's all right. My wife is will Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this won't be, this is rated PG. This is fine. So we, we start from the very beginning here. You have your pantalettes, your chemise, and I do have a corset on here, but I won't show you that. Then I have my hoop skirt. Now, during the 1860s, it was more popular to have what they called a cage crinoline, and it did look like a cage. It was the, the whale boning straps that would go uh, horizontally, but then they would have cotton straps that would go vertically, uh, hooking all the straps together. So it was pretty see-through, and it was a lot more comfortable, actually, to wear in the, in the hot summer months. But then you would usually then wear a petticoat over it. And this is what's called a flounced petticoat. That way it would kind of hide the boning so the boning wouldn't show through your dress. And um, of course, every lady always wears gloves. Um, I, I was just saying earlier, I, I'm dating myself, actually, because I was told uh, by a, an expert at this that um, only older women wore fingerless bits, but that's okay. I'm an older woman, and I've earned the right to wear my, my fingerless mitts. But most of the time, um, they would be leather or uh, kit gloves, uh, especially if you're writing or whatever. Or they could be whole gloves, but I just like the looks of these. And um, your hair at, at, in the evening, you could let down. Uh, I'm wearing a hairnet, which was very, very popular. You might have heard of snoods. Uh, they really weren't that popular. You see them a lot at reenactments, um, but authentically, hairnets were more common. They might have decorative snoods that were made of silk, um, but not the ones that you, know, you see really manufactured today. Um, and, um, Could you tell us about the evening? Uh, oh, the, the ball gown bodice. Yes. Um, if you remember the, the photo on the postcard. Yes, in the evening, it was funny, in the evening you were allowed to show some skin. You couldn't during the day. But for some reason it was perfectly respectable to do it in the evening. So the ball gown bodice is always short sleeved and always at the shoulder. and most times showed a little bosom, and that was okay to do that. Um, there was a story about uh, when Mary was getting ready for a ball, and Mr. Lincoln is sitting in her dressing room. Mrs. Keckley, her dressmaker, is helping her get ready. And Mary did love to show off the top half, and was actually ridiculed a lot for it in the paper. But Mr. Lincoln noticed she had a very long train, uh, and very low cut. And he said to Mrs. Keckley, my, doesn't our cat have a long tail tonight? <laughs> but don't you think it would be better if we put some of that tail up on the top? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, should I go with questions? Anybody? Anybody? I'll be the microphone. John Regan, are you going to be at the reenactment in August at Pine Crest? Yes, and, I will be. I am uh, giving my presentation on Mary at 3 o'clock on Saturday, which I think is August 20th. So I will be there for that. The 21st. Is it the 21st? I think so. And is Ms. Mr. Lincoln going to be there too? I think it will be, as far as I know, the same Mr. Lincoln that was there last year. Robert 
Rogers, I think is his name. Charlie? Yep, okay. Sharon Carlson Keel, how did you get started with your interest in the history of who you depict? You know, that's an interesting story. I've had, I've had a lot of people ask me that. And I have always, I've been interested in Mary Lincoln for probably the last 20 years and been reading every book I can get my hands on and studying her. Um, and I think I decided to do Elizabeth because I liked Elizabeth personality. Um, I felt more drawn to her. Um, I look a little more like Elizabeth. And there are just a heck of a lot of Mary Lincoln presenters out there already. So I decided to do um, a sister thing and put a different twist on my presentations going as her sister. Nancy Rory Plymouth. Do you know if there was this mental instability in the Todd's ancestry? Uh, there is something to be said about that, which we can't go back too far uh, in, the, in the Todd's uh, as far as mental stability because there's nothing documented um, about that. But even my own daughter, Julia, my oldest daughter, when Robert had written to me about trying to get Mary out of Bellevue Place and was asking me if I could take Mary on, I had been through this before with our daughter Julia and even wrote to him that this type of mental instability does seem to run in the Todd's, as in the case of my daughter Julia. And Julia had a bit of a... Uh, uh, risque side to her and was a bit of an embarrassment to the Edwardses. And uh, she was very hard to um, control a lot. And not a lot has been written about what Julia did, but we know that even her own mother thought that there was a little bit of insanity in Julia. So she admitted that it is going down, down the line. Um, I just thought it was interesting how the sons of the Todds were, they were not very nice people. It seemed like the men turned out to be kind of violent and, um, and then here's Lincoln marrying the sister of one of these men. And I was just wondering if you wanted to make any comments about that or if you had any. Uh, the other thing too I wanted to say is it sounds like uh, Mary was a little bit bipolar. And I wondered if anybody had, had come up with that as a diagnosis for her. Well, first about the, the, uh, the Todd's. Um, yeah, I, I am not sure why the brothers were exactly the way they were. Temper, that part of the personalities uh, was seen in some of the sisters, too, but not to the extent as in the brothers. And I think maybe as women in general, women try to control their temper a little more than men, plus men coupled their temper with the drinking. And the drinking was very uncontrollable. Basically, all of those brothers were all alcoholics because of the, the way the lifestyles were at that time. Now, Robert Smith Todd, the father, he knew how to control his drinking. He was a social drinker, but he was a gentleman. And he was of that age where it, it didn't look good to be drunk. But for the brothers, um, they really didn't care. I think their, their tempers and their personalities took over. Uh, then your second question. Again. Yes. There, there's a book out that I read a couple of years ago. It's called The Addiction of Mary Lincoln. 
and I never really thought about her actually becoming addicted to drugs uh, because of her mood swings. We don't know whether that was the, the drug-induced part that created her mood swings or whether she was truly bipolar. Uh, there is even talk about even Mr. Lincoln being bipolar because he is well documented and he even uh, would talk about his deep melancholy that he would be in for days. But then he would snap out of it and he would tell his jokes and anecdotes and have everybody in stitches but then he'd sink back into his deep melancholy again. So the possibility that both of them were like that. And they knew, I think they knew each other so well that they had each other pegged. They knew when they were going to be going into these funks and hopefully they wouldn't go in them together because they, they would help uplift each other. And even Mr. Lincoln, talked about how he knew just how to treat Mary when she was very, very down or when she would say very cutting, uh, insulting things to people. And he would try to lighten up the air and she would realize what she said and feel very, very badly about it. But they were both very, very good for each other. Bob Domodolsky, uh, St. Nasians. Um, sort of answered some of my question already, but of all your siblings, would you consider yourself, and, and still keep your modesty, would you say you were probably the most stable of all your siblings? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my nature, to try to take care of everybody. Um, I, I didn't have a, a, a very loving relationship with some of my younger, younger sisters just because of the vast age difference between us. And I had already moved to Springfield by the time the younger siblings were born. And I didn't really leave Springfield that much because I had this huge social life that I had. Uh, I had children of my own. I know Mary and Mr. Lincoln traveled in 1847 to visit our stepmother and our younger children. But I, I just, I didn't, so I didn't have that relationship. But I knew how a lot of those girls were just in letters and hearing about them from other sisters. I didn't have that vicious tongue that everybody else had. And I was always trying to be the peacemaker between everyone. I wanted everyone to be happy. So that's why I agreed to take Mary uh, after the insanity trial. Even though I knew my heart really wasn't in it, I had had surgery earlier and just really wasn't feeling that well myself. But I knew if I couldn't take care of Mary, who would? So that was just in my nature. So yes, I escaped all of the negative personality traits of all the other top, si top siblings. Excluding yourself, you know, all your siblings from both mothers seem to have problems. So see if there are mental problems, uh, emotional problems, they seem to come from the father's side. From the father, absolutely. But yet your father was so very successful <coughs> and you seem to have found nothing really wrong with him. Is this just because has not been uncovered yet, or you think he was a very stable person? He must have been. He was so successful. I, I think he was very <coughs> stable. And like I said, he didn't let drinking get the better part of him. I think that had a lot to do with it, too. Whereas my brothers, they practically lived in the bottle, and that determined a lot of their personality, unfortunately. John Wiegand, I heard in a program 
several years ago that Abraham Lincoln said shortly before he was assassinated that one of the problems <coughs> they had to face in this country was the alcoholism, so it must have been <coughs> very widespread. It was. And that surprised me. I never had heard that before. It, it wasn't as much of a social stigmatism as it is now. I mean, it was more forgiven because it was so widely done. Um, but uh, even within the troops, uh, if they had uh, any uh, downtime at all, they managed to get themselves drunk. Uh, but I guess if I was in the situation that the troops were in. Maybe I'd want to try to drown my troubles too. But um, yeah, there are very few teetotalers, and Lincoln was one of them. And he didn't think highly of the drink because he didn't do it himself. And yeah, it, it did. It caused a lot of problems. Um, he was very accepting, though, to uh, General Grant, who was also an alcoholic. And Mary hated him because he was bloodthirsty and a drunk, but he once said that if he could get all of his other generals to be as successful, he will send every single general booze and get him drunk. Because uh, General Grant did, did produce the results that Lincoln wanted, but yet he, um, yeah, he was... He was known to, to tie one on a few times. Helen, yeah. So, where was your house located in Springfield? My house was located on 2nd Street. It was called the Mansion on the Hill. Uh, and a lot of people nicknamed it Aristocracy Hill because of my husband, Ninian. Ninian thought of himself as one of the few American aristocrats. He was kind of uppity about stuff like that. Um, but it was on 2nd Street. If you are to go to Springfield now, Plaza. It was torn down in the early part of the 1900s. Um, a, a group of concerned citizens banded together to try to save the house because it did have some historical significance. It went through a lot of transitions, like a lot of big old houses do you know, will become an orphanage or somebody buys it and puts it in as apartments. Mm -hmm. But it became very dilapidated and just wasn't made, able to be uh, renovated. And just because the state needed it for the new capital complex, it was torn down over 100 years ago. Uh, but there is a home that is part of the Lincoln neighborhood. It's a, a new home. Uh, right at the beginning of the street on, now Lincoln's home is on the corner of 8th and Jackson. So if you just go up one more block, there's a brand new home, brick home, that was designed and built to look like the Edwards's home. It, it doesn't look exact because it's not as big, uh, because the lot is very small. So it's a smaller replica of, of the Edwards mansion. So if you go there, you'll get a little bit of an idea of what their house looked like. Okay, we're going to call it a night here because it's almost time. And she did say she's going to be out at Pinecrest for the Civil War thing. And what we're going to do here, we're going to go one more time so we get everybody's name on record here. We're going to go down this side and up this side here. And seeing it is Flag Day, before everybody leaves, we're going to say the pledge after our introductions. And I'm going to give the microphone to Kathy, and she's got some. Oh, okay. We got these little permission slips there. Did everybody sign one of these? No. If you didn't sign one, we, we need to put it because this tape will be in the library. Oh, you were here before, so you signed it I'll just make a, a little. I do have some business cards here. Uh, if anyone would like one, if you're a member of another group or you know someone who belongs to a church group or a ladies group or another historical group, feel free to take one. And 
and get in touch with me. So I'll just leave those there. Okay, I think we ought to give her a big, big round of applause. Wait for my cameraman. Charlie, I'll follow you through. Okay, Charlie Bauer from Newton. Okay, thank you. Kathy Sixo Newton. Thank you. Cheryl Bauer Newton. Thank you. Marie Rosenbauer Newton. Very good. Lisa Alveson Newton. Thank you. Brian Charlie Manitowoc. Janet Vogt Manitowoc. Thank you. Don Vogt Manitowoc. Very good. Good, thank you. Marilyn Heineman, Howard's Grove. Thank you. John Wiegand, Cinderville. Thank you. Melva Walk, Schleswig. Thank you. Elaine Walk, Schleswig. Thank you. <laughs> Elaine Dine, Cleveland. Good, thank you. Alice Mathias, Cleveland. Thank you. Selma Bovo, Cleveland. Thank you. Bob Domagolski, St. Nazians. Very good, thank you very much. Kenny Hawken, Philip Sheboygan. Shepard Goodnell, Sheboygan. Thank you. Janet Miller, Cleveland. Thank you. <coughs> Helen Nassup, Manitowoc. Thank you. Pat Power, Newton. Thank you. Sharon Carlson, Keel. Thank you. Alice Waldo, Manitowoc. Very good. Thank you. Eileen Bailitz, Cleveland. Thank you. Kathy Yaney, Cleveland. Now, the name is Cleveland. Thank you. <coughs> there you go. <coughs> Russ Weberstead, town of Sheboygan. Thank you. And Joan Weberstead, town of Sheboygan. Thank you. Keisha Glendale. Thank you. Victor Shell Glendale. Audrey Erlo, St. Nadian. Good. Twilight Schrader, Cedar Lake. Thank you. Beth Hollander, Cedar Lake. <coughs> Jean Pfeiffer, Sheboygan. Thank you. I got that. Thank you. Here we go. Bernice Erlicker, Sheboygan. Good. Mary Ann Thompson, Sheboygan. Good. Jerry Leonard, Town of Sheboygan. Good. Rick Byersdorf, Town of Mamie. Thank you. Nancy Rory, Plymouth. Very good. Susan Curtis, Plymouth. Thank you. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, go right ahead, please. Next month, we are going to meet on July 12th, and we are going to talk about the Depression. And uh, for anybody that would like to have a card, an invitation, please give me your address. Those of, lots of you will uh, get a card, but some of you don't, and if you'd like one, please let me know. I also want to thank Denise for the wonderful educational presentation. And I want to thank Charlie and uh, Cheryl for their wonderful PR, for putting this in the newspaper. Thank you so much. And you also, Jerry. Thank, thank you. you.